Name. Right, swap to the new dog. Ow. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going. This is so bad. <laughs> Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Eternal Palace where we have now tested eight out of the nine bosses. That's right, the only boss we are actually missing right now is Queen Ashara herself. And into it we went with another three bosses being tested. They're being very aggressive with the testing on this raid. And unfortunately a mixed bag, including what seemingly, <laughs> for anybody who tried this thing, uh, believes is the worst boss ever created. I do not, under any circumstances, realize how overbearing that statement is. But I kind of agree. I kind of agree. Absolute wash of, of standards. And it kind of comes down to the quality of rating overall. So at the end of this video, I'm going to give uh, a score because we may see Queen Ashara and Heroic. Sometimes they like to keep the final boss under wraps, uh, particularly if there's some sort of extra stuff. But now they tend to put the extra stuff in Mythic. So they do. we did see things like Heroic Gahoon, etc. So we'll wait and see. But in case they don't, uh, they will, I'll give you like a grading out of 10 for each of these bosses because it's a very mixed bag in eternal palace so far a very mixed bag uh so the first boss we got to test was actually boss number seven uh, i believe so yeah boss number seven which was the queen's court the queen's court now this is overlap the boss they really have ran with the idea of overlapping and gone absolutely mad with it that because that's all this boss is is overlap the boss and as a, as such a lot of our focus for raid testing because it wasn't particularly difficult we killed it almost immediately and well again i remind you guys our intention during raid testing is not to kill the boss it's actually if we can kill the boss fine then we'll intentionally wipe uh, at very low percentages and then we try the boss in different ways and we try a number of different abilities how do our individual classes kind of mix with these it helps with planning what classes are going to be better going forward and i'm sure you guys want a video on that as well which is like which classes are looking good once we get into the eternal palace is it going to stay the same with shadow priest warlocks and, and shaman and thing like that or is it going to become more melee friendly and so on <clears throat> So that's what we tend to do. Uh, so in this fight, you're going to have two NPCs to deal with. Uh, Silvaz the Zealous and Pajma the Fanatical. And each of them have a great deal of abilities. So if you're not good at recognizing, and I know there are a lot of people who are in this boat, and I fully understand it because it does take a good couple of goes to really get your head around it. Recognizing a number of different abilities. Like each of them has four or so different abilities they can use, if not five and that means in total there's 10 different abilities that are coming out all the time and you have to know how to deal with each one individually because some of them affect the whole group some of them affect individuals and you need to be able to not only recognize which of these abilities it is because they all have kind of strange names so it's like frenetic charge okay i'm being charged then you have suffering deferred sentence form ranks stand alone all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, going through the book here, you can see Mighty Ruptures. Then you have Silvara's Touch, Pasma's Touch that you have to deal with. All kinds of things going on with these bosses that you need to be able to deal with and recognize. And the this boss does these things randomly. Like, we got a feel for some of the abilities. So, let me give you some examples. So, there's a charge which needs to be soaked by the group. So... You want to be, whoever's getting charged, you want to be running to that person and grouping up with them so it hits you and spreads that damage out. Otherwise, that person dies. Uh, there's also one that's basically an ex execution sentence uh, from a paladin, so that one needs to move out. Uh, there's also a zealous eruption from one of the bosses where he's going to do a big AoE around him, but you need to soak it, so you want to run into that. There's then another ability that makes you want to stand still, uh, which is kind of an interesting ability. There's then another ability which makes you all need to be spread around from one another, right? So you have all these different things going on around you. And simultaneously, you'll have things like circles appearing on the floor, and those need to be stood in. And there'll be two at a time, at least on Heroic, at least on the scaling that we did, where you'll need to stand in them, and then they'll disappear, and some more will spawn, so you have to move around and do all these kinds of things. So you have all these different uh, events happening, these different abilities happening, that sometimes a couple of them can overlap, because these, these abilities come out pretty much constantly. Uh, which means that they're far more dangerous. So on Mythic, I, I believe during Heroic, we get two at a time. 
Uh, the bosses have like a set of abilities each and they can use they can use one each at the same time. However, on Mythic, it will be three, which can get really messy. And it actually reminds me, and I know this is going to be a bit out of there for some of you, but Omnitron Defense System on Heroic, uh, when it first launched, Omnitron Defense System had a random order that the robots could spawn and they would stick to the order that they would spawn. And some orders were dramatically easier than another. And we ran into it here. There's a rather interesting mechanic in the fight that puts a set amount of damage on you, right? So you are going to take, let's say, 800,000 damage. You're going to take that. That's obviously far more than your HP. Uh, so what can you do with it? Well, it's got a countdown. And the way this ability works is if you stand still, you won't take any damage. And then when the timer runs out, you'll take the full 800k damage. If you move around and start running, then you will start taking a dot damage and reducing the overall damage that you'll take at the end. So if you just run constantly, you can actually take a lot of dot damage, a lot of damage over time, and that will eliminate all the 800k damage so that when the timer runs out, you won't take any. If you move around a little bit and say get rid of 400k damage, then you will take 400k at the end of the timer. You get the idea. You've got this bucket of damage your character is going to take and you get to choose how much of it you will take at the end by how much you move around, how much you damage yourself. Which is kind of cool. So we had a strategy where we just did like a dance, <laughs> basically, uh, with a lot of cooldowns. Because it always seemingly could paired up with the AoE ability from the other boss where you had to be soaking it together. So it meant that the raid had to gather. And therefore, we could just run around in circles and just get rid of all this damage. And then we'd all take the big hit. And we'd have healing cooldown sharing that damage amongst the most of us. So it worked out okay in that regard and became a nice little tactic for us. Uh, simultaneously, you might have something else going on, such as the charge. And if the charge is going on on somebody who's not part of this group, then you're going to need to get to them. Or the charge might go on while you need to be spread. Which means there are so many abilities here. And this is my concern. Because this boss is kind of okay. It's kind of fun. It's very engaging because all different abilities are happening. You have to be aware of what's going on. So as long as you're comfortable with what's happening, it's kind of an engaging boss. I didn't mind this one at all. Uh, but what I will say... <clears throat> is because there are so many abilities that have mixed types of damage from physical to magic and also things like charges where they're trying to hit you things that need to be soaked in groups and things where you can pre-plan where to go lots of ways of bypassing a lot of the mechanics here which i think blizzard's probably going to look into uh, for example you could get out the way of the charge and if you got out the way of the charge it didn't hit you it didn't need to be shared it didn't need to be soaked and it also didn't leave this rumbling earth like shaman earthquake style effect on the floor if he didn't hit you because you moved out the way uh, then simply it, nothing happened now the idea is that's not supposed to happen <laughs> Just to be clear, you're not supposed to be able to just get out of the way of it, uh, but you absolutely could with various abilities. And that meant that you bypassed that mechanic entirely and therefore freed the raid up. Because the difficulty and the interest in this encounter is having to work with your raid about what's the best solution. So a couple of concerns in terms of how certain abilities were over overlap, such as like having to be spread Will we, in Mythic, certainly, will we be getting that at the same time that we kind of need to gather? And we're going to have to do this sort of, like, very, very pre-planned ability. Are we going to get that at the same time as having to move to something else? I mean, there's ways around it. I'm just worried that if they're going to have the abilities at random, and this is more the case. Like, I don't think anything will be too difficult to deal with. But if they're going to have the abilities at random, then we could be looking at somebody who does a first pull. They get a really convenient order of abilities, and it's just not a big deal. And they just smash the boss. Whereas another guild gets there and they get a really awkward series of abilities, like back to back to back, because that does happen. It happened on Omnitron all the time, which is why I'm referring to it, is there are lots of occasions where you would pull and you'd be like, well, I certainly intend, man, like this fight is undoable. Literally, that was the situation we faced. This fight is not doable with this order of robots, and therefore we just kind of have to wipe it and pull again and see what order we get next time. Uh, so that was the Queen's Court. Decent enough boss, quite like this. The next one they gave us was Zakil, or Zakul, the Harbinger of Nialotha. Now, as always on the PTR, some things are really buggy, and we're aware of that. But this fight was kind of cool. I actually got into it, but I think it was a kind of mixed reaction to this boss from the overall raid team that we had that night. Um, I really liked it. A lot of movement. The problem we had with this boss, which I think was annoying some people, is the damage values of some of the abilities he was putting out were just 
way, way, way above and beyond what they were supposed to be. Uh, sometimes four or five times more damage. And in fact, we did run into the problem once we got to sort of the final phase. Because this has four phases to it. Yeah, it has four phases to it. While we were in the final phase, one of the abilities was doing five times as much damage as it should do to the raid. And it was hitting five people at the same time, which means... We tried everything under the sun to survive this thing, including literally saving every defensive cooldown. So we would have things like spirit links, barriers, rallying cries, all these kinds of things. Everything we could possibly muster, personal cooldowns. So there was just no way you could possibly survive. There was just no way. Uh, so we didn't get much further than that because there was just no way of doing it as far as we could see. Uh, but how does this boss work? Well, he has very different realms. Zakul himself exists in all realms at once. Uh, but you're going to have the realm of fear, the realm of delirium. You're going to have all these different realms, which are basically denoted by color. Okay, that's how you'll know which realm you're in. And each realm has different ab abilities that affect you. Now, the room remains pretty much the same besides the color changing. So the color changing is the clue as to which realm you're in. What we don't seem to have is any sort of effect that happens to you other than the room changing color that tells you you've moved between realms. So, the in opening realm, you're going to be dealing with the basic stuff, which is that he can put a fear on... We had it on three targets, but again, it's heroic, it's flexible. There'll be scaling issues, and how many it'll eventually be with a max raid and so on is always going to vary. Uh, but every time these fears were dispelled, then you did massive raid damage. Okay, you did huge raid damage. So, dispelling the three fears at the same time would wipe the raid. Uh, so, Tremor Totem was dangerous, as we found out. If you drop a Tremor Totem and it does remove the fear from all three, boom, everybody <laughs> dies instantaneously. Reminds me of some of the classic issues we had with uh, Mistweaver's revivals, where they uh, some certainly some players who weren't au fait with some of the debuffs in the game, certainly ones that would cause damage upon being dispelled, would pop a revival, uh, which also dispels everybody who it hits, and therefore just instantly wipe the raid. So, some moments like that. Uh, but it's all about positioning. You've got this large circular room, but if you step outside the circle, you die. You have to stay in the circle. So if you're getting feared, obviously there's a worry there that you're going to be feared out of the circle. So it has this sort of Manoroth vibe to it, which is a, a reference that was brought up several times by the people testing it. And you also got these large tentacles. This is, of course, full Nazoth, and this time we've got full tentacles coming out and dealing with ads and things like that. And then we have this cool mechanic with the tanks, which seems designed to make sure the tanks have to move. It's a big, heavy movement fight. Uh, he's going to drop these maddening pools, and the boss needs to be in those pools when he finishes a certain cast. So that means that the tanks have to move the boss constantly in order to get to these pools, and it always, always seems to spawn exactly to the opposite of wherever the boss currently was, making sure you had to use the entire room. And a big part of that is once we get into phase two, the realm of fear, you're now going to have extra debuffs put on the raid, as well as the fear. That's still going to be happening. Uh, but also these debuffs, which leaves pools everywhere. And these last a really long time. Uh, I believe you can soak them up. You can do that. But for the most part, they do a tremendous amount of damage. And also start blocking off areas of the room, making it more difficult to traverse while the tanks are still continuing that mechanic of having to move the boss around. Once you get into the delirium phase, which you can then move into, uh, you'll have more things to deal with, such as being unable to be healed, right? Having to deal with a situation. And then you'll have an NPC appear and give you a portal to get out of the delirium phase. It was completely random who went into the delirium phase. Not everybody does. It's like it pulls you into the realm. If you think of uh, Kalik, uh, Caligos, for those of you who did that in the Burning Crusade, very similar sort of idea. Uh, but even a tank didn't get picked on several occasions. So there seemed to be no rhyme or reason as to who got picked to go down there. But once you were in there, your idea was to try and get the hell out of there because it was pretty bad and you were going to get all wrecked up and stuff. But unfortunately, we didn't get to test much more than that because the dread ability, this fear effect um becomes incredibly <laughs> comes so much worse in stage four which is all the pathways are open the final phase is actually hit around 60 percent so what you've got here is a boss that within the first 40 percent shows you all its abilities and then the main fight begins at 60 percent you're going to get huge damage buffs on certain people to burn the boss down etc 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 uh but it was just unmanageable for us at least from what we found unless we were missing a gimmick or something it just became unmanageable to maintain that phase because the amount of damage that was going out on the raid couldn't be stopped so there was like no realistic way of dealing with the encounter you couldn't even let the people die because the debuff would still expire and, ex and kill everybody uh so we tried various things but we couldn't really figure a way around it but in that phase all access to all the realms is open and you'll be moving between them and doing all that kind of stuff i would certainly say i would like better feedback on 
<clears throat> if you're being transported and who is transported because if you die in one of the realms you transfer back to like the living realm and that means that people can't be combat rest or anything like that which is really irritating honestly uh it's genuinely irritating but they do have some mechanics which should mean that if you die while you're in the delirium realm you get another chance a bit xavier style so it's an interesting boss i didn't get to test the full thing but i found this okay i found this fine i had to pay attention to a lot of things lots of multi dying going on really cool for melee again really cool for melee massive amounts of cleave damage going on all sorts of stuff which involved the melee taking part i, I really like that i think the melee enjoyed that one so let's get to it <sighs> Possibly the worst boss ever made. Um, the Blackwater Behemoth. This is the boss that people were really concerned about for such a long time because it is the underwater boss. Now, I was kind of okay with this. I mean, people will obviously point to streams where I was like, I'm okay with them trying an underwater boss. They've just gone completely the wrong way with it, which is really unfortunate because it's not bad by de facto being underwater. And my reference to that is underwater mechanics we have seen in bosses that aren't underwater, namely Alakia. Alakia's final phase in the air is really cool. That's an underwater boss. It's just not visually underwater. You're dealing with the same mechanics of being underwater in that fight. Um, and nobody complains about that. <laughs> not many people complain about Alakir Phase 3 or 4 or whatever it was. Uh, even though it was the same thing. The same with Kael'thas, actually. Kael'thas Sunstrider in the Burning Crusade also had a, an anti-gravity phase, which is essentially just being underwater. Uh, it was no different. It just didn't visually re look like you were underwater. Uh, but it played the same. Uh, but unfortunately, they've really just shit the bucket with this thing. Like, <sighs> if you've been paying attention to any of the feedback threads, for those of you who are really into raiding and not been able to test, you will have seen the, the big posts of people who are just like, just remove this boss. Like, it's a disaster. Um, hard to argue with it in its current state, but to be positive and to give feedback, let's talk about what it actually is. Uh, so it does take part in the area we showed last video, which is these large underwater caverns. That is just the boss arena. A little unfortunate. I, I mean, obviously... Once I entered that arena before the boss was in there, I was like, this looks like it could be a boss arena, but I'm kind of hoping it's not because one, it's really big. It's really, really quite big. Like how much are we dedicating to this boss? Uh, how much are we really going to be interested in this thing? And it also means that there's no pathways underwater and stuff that we know. Of. I mean, I've seen like eight out of nine bosses now. So that means there is nothing else to really see besides the final boss room, wherever that might be with Queen Ashara. So that's kind of it. It's just, a, it's just like um, it, it changes what could be a vast array of underwater city living and dwelling, which is something I was hoping to see in the Eternal Palace. It changes it into it's just like a, a, a boss arena that's underwater. That's just where the fish lives. Like, you have to go out of your way to go and kill the fish. Now, it is boss number two. Now, I will say this. This is the first time ever uh, in my long, long history of testing bosses on the PTR for Blizzard and trying to provide as much feedback as possible um, that the raid group voted to stop testing. Like, we had a vote. <laughs> the raid was like, I just do not want anything to do with this boss anymore. And we actually stopped about 25 minutes into the fight. Couple of reasons for that. One, the boss wasn't working correctly. Like, they had so many bugs, obvious problems with it. It wouldn't melee the tank sometimes, uh, even though the, the, the tanks were like, I'm literally stood inside the fucking thing at this point, and it's just not hitting me. It doesn't pick up that I'm here. Um, it would just start meleeing the melee. It was doing all sorts of stuff. It's hits boxes, hit boxes all over the place. Uh, the way uh, some of the abilities such as slipstream, which is what this boss is supposed to do, uh, weren't doing what it was supposed to do, which meant we literally stood around for a while like before we could do things. Let me explain the boss to you and this will make more sense. As you enter the boss arena, there is currently an unmarked, uh, not very easy to see, uh, little clam thing on the right hand side. And that will provide you with full underwater breathing and 20% movement speed. But that is 20% movement speed in water. So you're still way 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 slower than you are on ground they give you 20 percent movement speed but it is just so slow uh even alakir had a massive speed increase while you were dealing with that last phase which made it not annoying and actually quite fun because you could move super quick uh now you're really slow so you're gonna play the whole uh, currently you're playing the whole fight like you're stuck in mud like you're traveling through water you know you get dismounted and you're stuck in water and you're just trying to kind of walk through it it's like that yeah i know it's a bummer. Uh, and then you'll see the eel fish blackwater behemoth down there. And the idea is you can't be healed. You can't be healed. But around the room, there are puffer fish. And for some reason, and I think this again was a bug, the puffer fish have a huge amount of HP. 
Like, so much HP. And when you finally do kill a, buff, a puffer fish, like, we ended up just lusting the puffer fish down to test the boss in some way. Then it will just leave this giant area of uh, green goo, this bioluminescence. And then you have to run into it and gain the buff, and this means you can be healed. So if you go into the bioluminescent splurge, then you can get healed. And it's only temporary, of course. It will eventually wear off you. Uh, so you deal with this. Now, the problem is he's also doing chain lightning on anybody who's too clumped. And he does this while you're running into the field. <laughs> while you run into this field. And this bioluminescent, uh, for the sake of immersion, I'll explain it this way. If you have the bioluminescent algae on you, uh, it also makes you a target for the jellyfish that are around the area. Which instantly one-shot you and also attracts other fish from the abyss. From deep below. So if you go off the platform at any point, you'll be killed. And also a giant fish will eat you. One of the two will happen rather quickly. Uh, so you've got to deal with it on basically three platforms. Uh, so it, this fight very much reminds me of uh, the Conclave of Wind. Again, coming back to this Alakir reference. I wonder if they took a lot of inspiration from there. Uh, unfortunately, it's missing all the things that made the Conclave of Wind very fun. Which was each platform was really interesting and involved the raid moving around separately and dividing into groups and moving to deal with things. That was such a, a significantly better encounter. And this one seems styled after it. So we have these various caves where the Blackwater Behemoth can appear from. He'll always start in the first one and then go to the second one and the third one. It's all preset. And he doesn't really do anything. Like, he just melees the tank and he puts debuffs on the tank, which is something we've seen forever. He chain lightnings people so you have to be spread. And that's, like, about it, honestly. Like, that does... It only does those things. And each of those things is really annoying. Because <laughs> there's no redeeming feature here. It's just, you've got to stay spread while moving really slowly. But you also have to gather up to get this bioluminescent cloud, which is really slow. You can get chain lightning while you're in there. So then you've got to swim back out again, slowly. He's also doing this AoE shock pulse, meaning... The, like, why would you ever bring melee to this fight? Because the shock pulse means melee can't DPS for quite some time. Because they can't leap out properly. Because it is water. A lot of cooldowns don't work. You can't use a feast, like, before the fight unless you do it on the ground. So you have to go out of the encounter to... You know, if someone misses a feast or something. All these things are just super irritable about this fight. Uh, ultimately, once, you, once his energy bar is full, he'll move to the next cave. So then you have to swim across the abyss... Um, in order to reach the next platform before he's doing the typical thing, which is he moves to another cave and now he casts his Oblitero spell, uh, which we've seen a lot of a lot of bosses apparently have their Oblitero spell, uh, yet they only do it like in certain special times. And you've got to swim over to him and you've got to swim through a little pathway of jellyfish. Now, the idea is there's a slipstream, which gives you some sort of speed increase, right? You can see the animation there. But it's supposed to remove the bioluminescent cloud because I told you before... If you have the bioluminescent buff, meaning you can be healed, then you are also able to be seen by the jellyfish and by the big fish that live down below that will gobble you up. Unfortunately, like, the, the slipstream wasn't working. So we ultimately just stood around, waiting for the buff to run out. <laughs> waiting for the buff to run out. And then you swim through the minefield of jellyfish, swim to the other side, and then you get to deal with the encounter again. It does the same things again. Uh, and that's it. That's it. So everything about this fight is just annoying. Like, I don't know why you would ever bring melee to this fight. Because it's the most melee unfriendly counter I've seen in a really long time. And as a range, there's nothing to do. You stand still. You kill a puffer fish. You DPS the boss. And then, magically, you go in and get the green buff and swim back out again and continue to just do damage. Like, nothing happens in this fight. It's And even though it's simple, it's still super boring and super irritating because while there's nothing going on, the thing that the, the realization that there's nothing happening is also even worse. It feels like they had an idea or they were like, okay, we're pretty sure we can make a cool underwater boss and it's just not worked. As it stands, this boss could be just removed from the raid and nobody would really be, in, nobody would be asked. <laughs> Let me tell you, nobody would be asked whatsoever. Is it salvageable? I mean, it's possible if you make everybody really quick. Like, if, you make, if you're going to keep it like this, then make everybody move really fast because the melee needs to be really fast to get out of the shock pulse. The range wants to be really fast because if you're going to make them run into this cloud and run back out again just to continue doing something else, I don't know. But this is a boss that I just don't think anybody's looking forward to. And it's a it's a complete fucking disaster, I'll be honest with you. It's a total disaster. I was looking forward to the underwater boss. I'm on record as saying that. I really was. There's lots of opportunity to make an underwater boss that's actually really fun. There's lots of opportunity for fun. And overall then, 
that gives us a very mixed bag of bosses in the Eternal Palace. Uh, going from boss one, Eternal Com Commander... There's no boss whatsoever that stood out to me as, like, this would be amazing. I had several of those in Battle for Dazzler Law and 50%. Of the Crucible of Storms. As soon as I saw Una, I was like, okay, this boss could be really cool. And it did turn out to be very cool. Uh, the same for Battle for Dazzler Law. Some really good bosses. You talk about even Jade Fire Masters. Krong, I really like still. I love the theme of Krong. I think that's really good. I really like the Jade Fire Masters. I love Opulence. I think it's such a great fight. I really enjoyed Mecha Talk. Like, I think that's really cool. And of course, Jaina. Very few bosses in the Battle for Dazzler Law that I think are. Uh, not very, very cool. Like Champions of Light, I don't think is very cool. Conclave of the Chosen is okay. Rastakhan's really fun. And I don't think Stormwell Blockade is as much fun as it could be. It seemed, it, once we got down to the bare bones of it, like mechanically, it was just very, very ordinary. And the Eternal Palace, nothing has really stood out for me yet. As like, this boss could be really cool. Maybe Lady Ashvane? Maybe. Uh, but we have two ultra terrible bosses so far. So we've got, uh, out of the eight that we've seen then, uh, that would be, of course, the Black Wards of Behemoth is awful. Ra Radiance of Ashara is also absolutely terrible, in my opinion. Abyssal Commander Savara, which is the first boss, I would give like a 6 out of 10. I think that's pretty good. Uh, Black Water Behemoth, a 0 out of 10. Radiance of Ashara, 1 out of 10. Lady Ashvane, I would give like a 7, and that's pretty good. Orgazoa, I would also give like a 7. It's a decent fight. It's not amazing, but it's decent enough. Uh, that's all right. Queen's Court, like a seven. It's a six to seven. Like, it's okay. Uh, if you it'll come down to what your personal strategies are, like if you're if you like struggle with little tiny mechanics uh, and overlaps and stuff, then this might be a big problem for you. Uh, but if not, then there's a lot of fun to be had here. Like Queen's Court can offer a lot of fun. Uh, Zakul, I'll give a seven to an eight potentially because we couldn't test the full thing. So that means we got some big swings, like in things that are nice here, but nothing that's made me go, this is really good. This is amazing. This is like an 8, 9, 10 level boss, right? No, nothing like that so far. Maybe Queen, Queen Ashara herself will bring that, bring that ratio up somewhat, but we'll have to wait and see. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.